Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to see you all. Brave bunch to come see what, what new finds in the vault we have. Yet more of them. A year ago, a year ago, we looked at some of the interesting things that have turned up in our work on GameinCat, the cataloging project, the online uh, catalog of our holdings. And that work continues. We remain in awe of the skills and knowledge of our two full-time project members, Barbara and David, who continue to not be satisfied with gaps in knowledge, but determined to dig out whatever they can find, wherever they can look, with all of the research now available on the internet, and they know what is true and what is false news or alternate facts. They do not fall for alternative facts. So today we continue our saga with more stories. First in the Johannes Herbst collection, a late edition that wasn't listed in the catalog of the collection edited by Marilyn Gambashi that was published in 1970. This is an oratorio, Die Feier der Christen auf Golgatha, by Johann Gottfried Schlicht. Dave Schicht, rather, not Schlicht, Schicht. Dave searched for other copies of this oratorio and found four. All are in Germany. One of those four is in Herrenhut. A copy of the manuscript parts of this oratorio is also in Moravian collections in North America in the Philharmonic Society of Bethlehem, with some of the parts copied by Johannes Herbst and also excerpts in the Lidditz Congregation collection. It was published in Leipzig in 1785. That's what the first page looks like, again, copied by Johannes Herbst. So this one is one we're going to need to edit. We're going to have to get this bad boy out. Schicht was, uh, he lived from 1753 to 1823. He was a student of Johann Adam Hiller, a conductor of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. He was a cantor at St. Thomas Church in Leipzig. Yes, the same St. Thomas Church that J.S. Bach served. He was a composer of three oratorios, a great deal of church music, and he published an edition of Bach's motets in 1802 or 1803. We have got to get this piece out there. This might be pretty good. The next little find, we're just going to skip through a whole bunch of stuff today. This is in the Salem Collegium Musicum collections. Was previously unidentified in our catalog. What we had was nine printed parts, flute, two oboes, two bassoons, two horns, two violins. The caption title is Tempo di Marcia. It's a theme and five variations, and there was no composer noted. The chip at the first two measures of violin one of this introduction didn't match anything in RISM, the International Music, music Database of Manuscript Music, but the flute part, eight measures in, does match the set of variations in A major by French composer Pierre Rhoda, who lived from 1775 to 1830. There's the flute part, eight measures in. That's how Barbara was able to identify the composer and the set of variations who wrote it. Barbara looked through the known plate numbers, the publisher's numbers, of various composers first to try to find a match for this publication. No luck. She then went to what we affectionately call MGG. It's Die Musik in Geschichte und Gegenwart, this massive multi-volume German language music dictionary that contains so much information about so many otherwise unknown composers. They had a lot of information, but nothing about this piece. The dictionary also indicated that some of this composer's works were published by Breitkopf and Hertel. So then Barbara went to the thematic catalog of Breitkopf's publications, looked under Rhoda's name, and found plate number 300, excuse me, 1639 with the title information. A, 1639, opus 19, variations for violin with orchestra in A major. Bingo, that's what it is. So lots of clues, lots of places to look. Next on our list is a violin concerto, the second violin part. It was identified, this is Salem Collegium Musicum Collection, was identified as a violin concerto by Italian composer Giovanni Battista Viotti, who lived from 1755 to 1824. Our copy lacks the title page, principal violin, and first violin. How are you going to identify a piece if you don't have the title page and you don't have the, the, the lead part? 
Barbara went to the thematic catalog of Viotti's works, and she was able to identify the work as Violin Concerto number 1.20 in D major. But there was no title page. There's no plate number, you know, little publisher's number. She couldn't identify the publisher. Here's the thematic catalog with the start of the second movement of number 20. There's a problem. The second movement of our printed edition doesn't match the opening of that second movement. Our printed edition, look at that. That doesn't look at all like that. So this one in the bottom right in the thematic catalog is an adagio. This one in the top left, adagio in D minor, the top left, what's in our copy, is an andante in A major. They're not at all alike. Didn't match. But there's a note in the thematic catalog. You probably can't read it, but what it says, probable first edition, Lewis, Houston, and Hyde, 1795, C piano arrangement. No example known. It is likely that this lost London edition contains, like the piano arrangement, the second movement of violin concerto number eight, rather than the adagio found in later editions. The Andante of Concerto 8 appears in this Concerto 20 in Viotti's Tempo catalog. So take a look. Here's at the bottom is ours, and at the top is the Andante Fondantino from Concerto number 8. They're not, uh, not identical because ours is the second violin part. Remember, we don't have a first violin part, but it, they sure go together. Same key, same temp uh, tempo indication, same uh, rhythm, da, 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 that sort of thing. So that's it. How odd. So what we have, we believe, is the first edition of Concerto Number 20 with this second movement that was, was in Concerto 8. Are you confused yet? <laughs> <laughs> I was, but Barbara had to go over and it was with me 14 times for me to get it clear. And she also wanted to thank Philip Dunnigan and the staff at the School of the Arts for their assistance in this, this detective work. Who would have ever thought that musicology and librarianship would be detective work? It is, it is. Uh, moving on to another cool thing that we haven't done much with yet. Ode on die Freude. Von Schiller. Anybody recognize that on die Freude Schiller text? There you go. Somebody's whistling from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. This is the one that Beethoven said in the Ninth Symphony. Same text. This is set for voice, chorus, and guitar. And no, it doesn't look at all like Beethoven. This is not Beethoven. So, um, this is a, you know, your guitar and solo voice part. I haven't heard it yet. I haven't sat down and played through it, but it looks like it'd be great fun. And Barbara hasn't found a record of another copy of this anywhere. We don't know that this exists anywhere else. So are we having fun yet? This is just, this is amazing. Um, this, this is, yeah, yeah. Is this complete? Yes, this word is. Yeah, Barbara says, yes, this work is complete in our collection. So, sounds like, aren't we going to have fun when we do a concert with the stuff we didn't know we had? I really think that would be great fun. That, that would be a terrific thing to do with this project. Um, and then we have a clarinet part, Salem Collegium Musicum number 39.2, a second clarinet part to something. I don't know if you can see or not, that it's broken down into lots of little fragments here. Let me get my little pointer to go up to, you get the, well, a little one too high. You get a section there. Then you get another section here after the fermata, the allegro. Then you get another section down here. The uh, an andante over here to the right, different key signature, different tempo. Lots of little sections in this thing and it just goes on and on and on like this. Barbara finally tracked it down. This is the entire second clarinet part from Beethoven's Mass in C major. What tipped her off? An unusual tempo marking. 
She went again to RISM, that that international database of music manuscripts, and chased down the unusual tempo marking, and then realized that, yes, this is that complete second clarinet part, all the movements just stuck in together. Um, so, detective work everywhere. Barbara, if there's anything you want to add to anything I'm throwing out here, you or Dave, either one, jump in. So. I'm enjoying this. Okay, <laughs> Barbara says she's enjoying just listening to the thing. Okay, clues turn up in odd places. One of the questions we've had a long time is, here comes that Wolf Easter cantata again. I keep talking about this thing. Um, we've wondered how the Moravians knew about that cantata. Why did Moravians seem to hold more of Wolf's compositions than most other institutions? We still don't know the answer to that, but there are some clues. <clears throat> This is in our music scores printed collection downstairs, Sonatinas by Wolf, owned by Johannes Herp. See the signature in the bottom right corner? Brother Herp's signature. Um, many of these early publications have at the beginning a list of subscribers, of people who supported the publication. Dave was looking at these, um, his copy of this and found a subscribers list there, and I know that's tiny print, but it tells you where they're from and how much, so you get a feel, like feeling for where, who knew Wolf's music in what cities and towns. Um, <clears throat> he found that list, and on the second page of that list, there's one at the top left corner in Neudietendorf. Here, Ernst Gottlieb Ellenberg, organist, Neudietendorf. Neudietendorf's about 38 kilometers or about 23 miles away from Weimar, where Wolf lived and worked. Dave looked up Brother Ellenberg in the Dienerblätter. The Dienerblätter, we've mentioned them before. It's um, a multi-volume set of like biographies, biographical sketches of notable Moravians throughout history. It's a fabulous resource for us. Uh, Brother Paul Poiker, who was at the time archivist of the Unity Archives in Herrenhut, presented a copy of this whole set to us on the dedication of this building 15 and a half years ago. It's been one of those things, now we can't imagine living without it. Um, Anyway, Dave looked up Brother Ellenberg in the Dienerblätter and discovered that he lived from 1751 to 1794. His parents brought him to Neudietendorf when he was eight years old. He stayed there until about 1786, and he was listed as Schulhalter und Organist, schoolmaster or school leader and organist. He was later called to serve in Latvia. So, wonder if he took any Wolf Sonatinas to Latvia with him. One never knows. So we're still chasing down all these connections of who knew who, who knew who when. The one major piece of Moravian musical research, one of the major pieces of Moravian musical research, we might call a musical scholarly, musical compositional um, genealogy. Who taught who? Who knew who, whose music? Where did it all chase around? Um, it would be fascinating to just discover Whose music did each of these composers know when and how did it influence their own compositions? So how did knowing Wolf's music influence Herbst's later composition, for instance? That sort of thing. <sighs> so many stories. And then we have a viola fragment. This was Salem Collegium Musicum 196.2 and it was cataloged as viola fragment. You'll notice there's no beginning. That looks like the end at the bottom, but there's no title page, there is no composer, there's nothing. Looks like the end of one movement and an andante of a second movement, another movement. Gee, wonder what that came from. <sighs> and it was identified, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how they had done this, as part of an E-flat symphony by Georg Anton, Anton Kreuser. We have a number of manuscript copies of his Opus I symphonies in the Salem collection and Lititz Collegium Musicum collection. So Barbara said, all right, which of his E-flat symphonies does this belong to? We got a work, a book uh, on Kreuzer, which included the thematic catalog. <clears throat> Barbara camped out in the vault for a while, comparing the clues in this fragment with the details in the thematic catalog. Key signature, time signature, movements, tempo markings, number of measures of this andante, that sort of thing. And looking at one of the pieces we had in the vault, 
we had, it was in Salem Collegium Musicum number 178.3. This was <clears throat> one of Kreiser's symphonies with a missing viola part, with an incomplete viola part. So Barbara took a look and said, sure enough, see there's the incomplete viola part in 178.3. Look at the bottom of the first page. Bottom of that page, there's looks like an allegro movement that started about halfway down the page. It ends, that doesn't look like an ending. So she said, what if I put them side by side? And she did, and it works, and the number of measures matches up with the other parts. It's in a similar hand, it, the, same, the same hand, I'd say, and it works as a set. So now we have the complete viola part in 178.3. That means we can play that symphony now, because we have it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Different composer. This, this is fun. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. It's getting to tell these stories. I had asked Barbara and Dave as they started work almost two years ago. I said, "Please just email me cool stories when you find them, because there's these. We need to be these stories need to be told." Uh, here we have excerpts from copied from CPE box collection of sonatas, um, eighteen sort of um, probostruka um, examples. Um, in six sonatas um, to accompany his CPE box treatise on playing keyboard instruments, his essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments. That was published in 1753. This is a direct copy from the 1753 published set, complete with fingerings and slurs. The manuscript is one folded leaf with one side, on one side the second movement entitled Andante Ma Innocentemente. There are two fragments on the other side from the beginning of the third movement and the end of the first movement. We're missing the page that would have the end of the third movement and the beginning of the first movement, a sort of a wrapper that would have gone around the other. So that's pretty cool to see that, that, that we didn't know what that was. And an exciting addition to the collections in Bethlehem just came in on January 18th. This is brand new, hot off the presses, folks. Dr. Paul Larson, retired professor of music at Moravian College and historian of the Bethlehem Bach Choir, visited our Bethlehem office to make a donation. What Dr. Larson, Paul, wanted to give was the publication of these sonatas with Johannes Herp's signature on the cover. He had had this. How, and this, by the way, there's the page on the inside. Look at that, andante ma innocentemente. And he put them side by side. If you can look at the music, you can see it's the same piece. How did this come to be in Paul Larson's hands? This piece, this publication was discovered in the Bethlehem Bach Choir archives by their music director, Greg, Greg Funfgeld, in 1992. Dr. Stephen Rowe from Sotheby's Auction House in London examined the music in November of 1993, indicated that it might be of some interest, and thought he could probably sell it for $1,500 or so if they chose to do that. The Bach Choir, instead of that, sold it to Paul Larson for much less than that because of his interest in Johannes Herbst and in Moravian music history. Paul has had it for this last 24 years and then decided it's time for it to go where it belongs within the Moravian Church. So this was a donation to us of this publication. Uh, that's just really exciting for us to have this now. Again, Johannes Herp's signature is on the cover of this publication. And another anonymous work we get to identify. Of course, my slide gave it away. Barbara identified this work um, as the string quartet in G minor, opus eight, number four, by Luigi Boccherini. Boccherini was an Italian composer, you've probably heard of him, lived from 1743 to 1805. He's born just three years before Johann Friedrich Peter. Boccherini had major influence on the development of the string quartet as a musical genre, and he composed the earliest known music for string quintet as early as 1771. Remember that Pater composed his six string quintets here in Salem, finishing in January of 1789. Did Boccherini's work influence Johann Friedrich Pater? I don't know. 
I'm hoping to find someone who will look and analyze all this music and find out. We do know that some of our holdings, our holdings do include several of Baccarini's quartets, both here in Winston-Salem and in the Bethlehem collection as well. So we've got his music. I don't know exactly when it came in, um, and I don't know, for instance, whether Peter copied any of those or not, but it's very possible. So moving along, flying through the discoveries today, collections of marches. There are eight folders of single parts, each in a different folder with some overlap in the con uh, contents. And the tunes include such things as Jackson's Favorite March, Bonaparte's Grand March, General Harrison's March, Syrian March, Yankee Doodle, Governor Swaim's March, Senator Mangum's March. Don't you want to know who all these are? General Polk's March, Mecklenburg Guard March, German March, British March, General Coffee's March, Life Let Us Cherish, Hail Columbia, March of the Dresden Bodyguard, Boston Quickstep, you know, all sorts of wonderful titles. Um, Philip noted that there are printed band books in Bethlehem that we have yet to investigate. Sounds like fun to try to do some cross-referencing in here and see how many of these individual parts turn up in these part books in Bethlehem. Lots of fun to be had there. More projects. I was just in uh, Florida last week at Rollins College uh, visiting uh, their, their, one of the young women who came to the Moravian Music Festival in 2013 well, several of them have finished master's degrees since then. One of them is back at Rollins teaching a course in Moravian music this spring. She has eight students in the class. Right now, each of them is doing an edition from a copy of manuscript. There will be 15 to 20 Rollins students coming to the Moravian Music Festival this summer. What's exciting to me is seeing a young generation of fascinating, fascinated, bright, scholars wanting to do research in Moravian music. Boy, have we got work for them to do. So, but it's terrific to see that the ripples are going out, that Rollins has, John Sinclair at Rollins has been bringing students to Moravian Music Festival since, 2000 and, since 2003. Um, several of his students have PhDs now and are teaching segments on Moravian music in their courses at different universities. So the word is rippling out, folks, and there will be more scholarship going on, and there's plenty to do. And this, in the library, stories I didn't have time to tell last year. We have in the library a facsimile of the 1531 hymnal edited by Michael Weisse. This facsimile edition was published in 1931. The copy that we have in the library was inscribed from Lawrence Heisey to Thor Johnson. There's an inside, by the way, there's an inside page of it. Notice German text and hymn tunes are in there as well. That's a beautiful little book. So we don't have the original 1531, but we have two copies of the, of the 1931 reprint of this hymnal. There are some familiar tunes in there. By the way, um, theologically speaking, Michael Weiss sort of went off on his own when he was editing this hymnal, and um, the uh, theology of Holy Communion in there is uh, very Zwinglian. Very, very much um, the Holy Communion is just, a, just symbolic and just a representation and there's really nothing significant to it. Um, the uh, Unity Elders sort of took hold of this after this book was printed and said, ruh -roh, and they put Jan Rowe to re-editing, who, who printed another hymnal in 1544. And we have before done studies of some of the hymns that refer to Holy Communion. There are significant changes in those hymns between those two hymnals. That's just a lot of fun. And yeah, this is the 1531. The inscription on the front cover was from Lawrence Heisey to Thor Johnson, to my friend Thor Johnson in appreciation of his personal musical accomplishments as director and conductor and in special appreciation of his efforts toward revitalizing early American Moravian music. Signed, Lawrence Heisey, June 7th, 1953. This was after the first Moravian Music Festival that was in 1950. The second was in 1954. Lawrence Heisey was from Wisconsin. 
He attended the first 18 Moravian music festivals from 1950 to 1992. 1992, his daughter Hetty brought him to the festival in Bethlehem. He was in a wheelchair. He was not able to participate as such, but he was sure there, and he just thoroughly enjoyed it. I remember sitting and talking with him during the rehearsals. And of course, Thor Johnson conducted the first 11 of these Moravian music festivals from 1950 to 1974. <clears throat> Dave tells me, by the way, that J.S. Bach owned a copy of this 1531 Gesangbuch. A library in Scotland now holds that copy that Bach owned. And a loose leaf inserted at the beginning of that copy has a note written by Charles Burney. This book, which formerly appertained to Sebastian Bach, was given to me at Hambro by his son, Charles Philip Emanuel, 1772. And there are about 10 to 12 chorales um, that are set by Bach that originated either in text or in melody in Weiss's book. So, See, so here's another thing we haven't explored yet, is the Moravians' influence on Bach. We've thought about Bach's influence on the Moravians. Did it go the other way? Sounds like it might have. <laughs> okay, um, you've heard me talk for the last several years about Gemeinkat, our cataloging project. You've seen Barbara and Dave working here for two full years now. If you're on our mailing list, you received a special appeal letter inviting your support of this project. A quick look at the whole project, where we are now and where we're going. This is what you see here is a photograph of the Salem Collegium Musicum on the shelf downstairs. Our holdings are divided into collections by their origin and the nature of the collection. <clears throat> the Johannes Herbst collection is a set of full scores he copied for his own private library. The congregation collections are those that originated in worship in the various settlement congregations, Nazareth, Bethlehem, Lidditz in Pennsylvania, Dover in Ohio, Salem here. Um, the Collegium Musicum or Philharmonic Society collections are those that originated for use in informal gatherings of musicians and townspeople outside of worship. You got all these string players and flute players and horn players and they're like, they're not gonna be content just to accompany anthems. They won't play for fun and they're going to. So let's get them music and they did, lots and lots of it. And there are later collections also in our holdings of the works of specific composers, Francis Florentine Hagen or Margaret Vardell Sandresky, for example. Looking down the row of one of our rows of collections, there's 10 or 12 different collections on that one row. That's just here. That's, there's, uh, and there are some 330 boxes of music downstairs in our vault and about twice that many in the vault in Bethlehem uh, of the, the collections that originated in the northern province. We're converting the card catalog collection by collection from these wonderful cards to online records. By the way, we're not throwing away the cards. Um, but these cards, you can't really see clearly here, have so much information on them. Composer title, the composer's dates, the instrumentation, the number of measures, the key it's in, any the tempo, any the source of text if we knew it, and the musical in ship it, the first few measures copied in, hand copied in on there. Uh, we're keeping all that information. We're not losing a bit of it. So first, our process is that we make sure that each collection is fully cataloged with all that information. Uh, second, we send that data, either the original cards or a spreadsheet that one of our catalogers has worked out, to Backstage Library Works. It's a company based in Provo, Utah, but which has an office, conveniently enough, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The professionals at Backstage do the actual conversion from typed card to what I call library speak, the coded machine language that makes everything in the catalog searchable online. Uh, I know that when we were converting the Philharmonic Society of Bethlehem collection, they did it really, really quickly and we commented on that and they, we were told, oh, we had 21 catalogers assigned to your project. And we thought, oh my goodness. Look at how the Moravian Music Foundation is contributing to the national economy. <laughs> We're hiring librarians. <laughs> so anyway, Backstage Library Works, they load these newly concerted, converted records into OCLC, an international library database. It's used by libraries worldwide, and it contains millions and millions of descriptions of books and manuscripts. Our staff can access these records. And then there's what we, what we call the walkthrough. Each record is checked against the manuscript where possible and some specific Moravian-related facts are added. 
For instance, if we know it's an anthem that was written for May 5th, it's coded Single Sisters Covenant Day. Uh, so that way we can find pieces that were written for the single sisters or for the single brothers or for a special occasion of some sort. Uh, and so we have, here's Barbara and Jan working in Bethlehem. Uh, Jan Harkey is working on, she's creating musical enchipets for the ones that did it. She's coding those in. We have them hand copied, but you don't just take a picture of it. If you take a picture of it and upload it as a picture, you can't search on it. There's a, a program that allows them to take those musical notes and code them in. It's called plain and easy code. I'm told it's neither plain nor easy, but I haven't tried it yet. So they are working on these musical enchipments and getting them in so that you can search on, if you know the first six notes of the piece, you can search on that So to find that piece. This project also includes public presentations about it. There's Dave doing his thing at last year's American Musicology Society Southeast Conference. Uh, Barbara and Dave both presented at that conference um, in, uh, topics relating to this cataloging project. As of January 4th of this year, and Barbara's been to several library association things, they're, they're both popping all over the place doing things, which is really cool. As of January 4th, these are the collections that are online. That is by far the bulk of our major collections. We're not done with the walkthrough. All of them get a walkthrough, and there's still some missing pieces here, some things that aren't online and visible yet. We anticipate that by the end of this year, yes, 10 months from now, all the major collections will be online. We will have created the musical and chippets for most all of them. This is making us visible in the scholarly world in a way we never have been. Okay, I'm done. Questions? Did I put you to sleep? Did I wear you out? <laughs> Yes. 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 We had to. These librarians never get applause. Yes. This is a. Our librarians have also determined that they are subversive. Librarians are very subversive. So, other questions, comments, observations. All right. So next month, 9th of March, Wachovia's last pioneer. Thank you so much, and see you next month. Okay. <laughs>